Spiritual Friendship, Part 3 Alred, at first, as I see it, nature itself impressed upon the human soul a desire for friendship, then experience increased of that desire, and finally the sanction of the law confirmed it. For God, supremely powerful and supremely good, is sufficient good unto himself, since his good, his joy, his glory, his happiness, is himself. Nor is there anything outside himself which he needs, neither man, nor angel, nor heaven, nor earth, nor anything which these contain. To him every creature proclaims, You are my God, for you have no need of my goods. Not only is he sufficient unto himself, but he is himself the sufficiency of all things, giving simple being to some, sensation to other, and wisdom over and above these to still others. Himself the cause of all being, the life of all sensation, the wisdom of all intelligence. And thus, sovereign nature has established all natures, has arranged all things in their places, and has discreetly distributed all things in their own times. He has willed, moreover, for so his eternal reason has directed, that peace encompass all his creatures and society unite them, and thus all creatures obtained from him who is supremely and purely one, some trace of that unity. For that reason, he has left no type of beings alone, but out of many has drawn them together by means of a certain society. Suppose we begin with inanimate creation. What soil or what river produces one single stone of one kind? Or what forest bears but a single tree of a single kind? And so, even in inanimate nature, a certain love of companionship, so to speak, is apparent, since none of these exists alone. But everything is created and thrives in a certain society with its own kind. And surely, in animate life, who can easily describe how clear the picture of friendship is, and the image of society and love. And though in all these respects animals are rated irrational, yet they imitate man in this regard to such an extent that we almost believe they act with reason. How they run after one another, play with one another, so express and betray their love by sound and movement, so eagerly and happily do they enjoy their mutual company that they seem to prize nothing else so much as they do whatever pertains to friendship. For the angels, too, divine wisdom provided, in that he created not one but many, among them pleasant companionship and delightful love created the same will, the same desire. Assuredly, since one seems to be superior, the other inferior, there would have been occasion for envy, had not the charity of friendship prevented it. Their multitude thus excluded solitude, and the bond of charity among many increased their mutual happiness. Finally, when God created man, in order to commend more highly the good of society, he said, It is not good for man to be alone. Let us make him a helper like unto himself. It was from no similar, nor even from the same, material that the divine might formed this helpmate. But as a clearer inspiration to charity and friendship, he produced the woman from the very substance of man. How beautiful it is that the second human being, taken from the side of the first, so that nature might teach that human beings are equal and, as it were, collateral, 
and that there is a human affairs neither a superior nor an inferior, a characteristic of true friendship. Hence, nature from the very beginning implanted the desire of friendship and charity in the heart of man, a desire which an inner sense of affection soon increased with a taste of sweetness. But after the fall of the first man, when with the cooling of charity concupiscence made secret inroads and caused private good to take precedence over the common wheel, it corrupted the splendor of friendship and charity through avarice and envy, introducing contentions, emulations, hates, and suspicions because the morals of men had been corrupted. From that time the good distinguished between charity and friendship, observing that love ought to be extended even to the hostile and perverse. While no union of will and ideas can exist between the good and the wicked, and so friendship which, like charity, was first preserved among all by all, remained according to the natural law among the few good they saw the sacred laws of faith and society violated by many and bound themselves together by a closer bond of love and friendship in the midst of the evils which they saw and felt they rested in the joy of mutual charity but in those whom wickedness obliterated every feeling for virtue reason which could not be extinguished in them left the inclination towards friendship and society so that without friendship so that without companionship riches could hold no charm for the greedy nor glory for the ambitious nor pleasure for the sensuous man there are compacts even sworn bonds of union among the wicked which ought to be abhorred. These, clothed with the beautiful name of friendship, ought to have been distinguished from true friendship by law and precept, so that when true friendship was sought, one might not incautiously be ensnared amongst those other friendships because of some slight resemblance. Thus friendship, which nature has brought into being, and practice has strengthened, has by the power of law been regulated, it is evident, then, that friendship is natural, like virtue, wisdom, and the like, which should be sought after and preserved for their own sake as natural goods. Everyone that possesses them makes good use of them, and no one entirely abuses them. Ivo, may I ask, do not many people abuse wisdom? Those, I mean, who desire to please men through it, or take pride in themselves by reason of the wisdom placed in them, or certainly those who consider it a thing that may be sold, just as they imagine there is a source of revenue in piety. Alred. Our Augustine should satisfy you on this point. Here are his words. He who pleases himself pleases a foolish man, because, to be sure, he is foolish who pleases himself. But the man who is foolish is not wise. And he who is not wise is not wise because he does not possess wisdom. How then does he abuse wisdom who does not even possess it? And so proud chastity is no virtue, because pride itself, which is a vice, makes conformable to itself that which was considered a virtue. Therefore, it is not a virtue, but a vice. Ivo, but I tell you, with your forbearance, that it does not seem consistent with me to join wisdom to friendship since there is no comparison between the two. 
Alred, in spite of the fact that they are not co-equal. Very often lesser things are linked with greater, good with better, weaker with stronger. This is particularly true of the case of virtue. Although they vary by reason of a difference in degree, they still are close to one another by reason of similarity. Thus, widowhood is near to virginity, conjugal chastity to widowhood. Although there is a great difference between these individual virtues, there is, nevertheless, a conformity in this that there are virtues. Now, then, conjugal chastity does not fail to be a virtue for the reason that widowhood is superior to contency. And whereas holy virginity is preferred to both, it does not thereby take away the excellence of the others. And yet, if you consider carefully what has been said about friendship, you will find it so close to, even replete with, wisdom, that I might almost say friendship is nothing else but wisdom. Ivo, I am amazed, I admit but I do not think that I can be easily convinced of your view. Allred, have you forgotten that Scripture says, He that is a friend loves at all times? Our Jerome also, as you recall, says, Friendship which can end was never true friendship. That friendship cannot even endure without charity, has been more than adequately established. Since then, in friendship, eternity blossoms, truth shines forth, and charity grows sweet. Consider whether you ought to separate the name of wisdom from these three, Ivo. What does this all add up to? Shall I say a friendship? What, John? the friend of Jesus, says of charity, God is friendship. Alred, that would be unusual, to be sure, nor does it have the sanctity of the scriptures. But still, what is true of charity, I surely do not hesitate to grant to friendship, since he that abides in friendship abides in God, and God in him. That we shall see more when we begin to discuss its fruition and utility. Now we have said enough on the nature of friendship in view of the simplicity of our poor wit. Let us reserve for another time the other points you proposed for solution. Ivo, I admit that my eagerness finds such a delay quite annoying. But it is necessary, since not only is it time for the evening meal, from which no one may be absent, but, in addition, there are burdensome demands of other religious who have a right to your care. The Fruition and Excellence of Friendship Alred, come here now, brother and tell me why you were sitting all alone a little while ago at some distance from us, when I was dealing with material affairs with those men of the flesh. There you were, turning your eyes now this way, now that. Then you would rub your forehead with your hand. Presently you would run your fingers through your hair. Again, frowning angrily. You would, with all sorts of faces, complain that something quite apart from your own desires has happened to you. Walter, you have described the situation perfectly. For who could preserve his patience through a whole day seeing those agents of Pharaoh getting your full attention, while we, to whom you are particularly indebted, were not able to gain even so much as a word with you? 
Alred. But we must show kindness to such people, too. For either we expect benefits from them, or we fear their enmity. But since the doors have finally been closed upon them, solitude is more gratifying to me now, in proportion as that preceding disturbance was distressing. You know, the best appetizer is hunger. And neither honey nor any other spice gives such relish to wine as strong thirst does to water. And so perhaps this conference of ours, like spiritual food and drink, will be more enjoyable to you because of the intense longing preceding it. Come now, and do not delay proposing to me that you were preparing to unravel from your troubled heart a little while ago. Walter. I shall, indeed, for it I be minded to make excuses because of the time. I shall be making even shorter the brief period they have left us. Tell me now, please, has it escaped your mind, or do you still remember the conversation which, once upon a time, you and your friend Ivo had on spiritual friendship? Do you recall that question he proposed to you? How far you advanced in the explanation of these, and what you set down in writing upon the same points. Elred, indeed, the fond memory of my beloved Ivo, yes, his constant love and affection are, in fact, always so fresh to my mind, that, though he has gone from this life and body, yet to my spirit he seems never to have died at all. For there he is ever with me. There his pious countenance inspires me. There his charming eyes smile upon me. There his happy words have such relish for me. That either I seem to have gone to a better land with him, or he seems still to be dwelling with me here on earth. But you know that... Very many years have passed since we lost that bit of paper on which I had written his questions and my answers on spiritual friendship. Walter, the facts do not escape me, but, to be candid, all my eagerness and impatience arises from the fact that I have heard from certain individuals that this very paper was found and handed over to you three days ago. Please, show it to your son for my spirit will not rest until I have reviewed the whole discussion and see what is still wanting in it, and then present to your fatherly examination for rejection or acceptance or explanation whatever my own mind or secret inspiration suggests to me as matters requiring discussion. Alred, I shall comply with your wishes, but I desire that you alone should read what is written on it in that it be not brought to public attention. For I may, perhaps, decide that some points are to be admitted, some added, and surely many to be corrected. Walter. Look, here I am, all ears to take in every word, the more avidly so since I have read on friendship has so pleasant a taste. Since, therefore, I have read this excellent discussion on the nature of friendship, I should like to have you tell me what practical advantages it procures for those who cultivate it. For though it is a matter of such moment, as you seem to have thoroughly proved by means of unassailable arguments, yet it is only when its purpose and benefit are understood that it will be sought after with genuine ardor. Alred, I do not presume that I can explain it in a manner befitting the dignity of so signal a good. Since in human affairs nothing more sacred is striven for, nothing more useful is sought after, nothing more difficult is discovered, nothing more sweet experienced, and nothing more profitable, possessed. For friendship bears fruit in this life and in the next. 
It manifests all the virtues by its own charms. It assails vices by its own virtue. It tempers adversity and moderates prosperity. As a result, scarcely any happiness whatever can exist among mankind without friendship, and a man is to be compared to a beast if he has no one to rejoice with him in adversity, no one to whom to unburden his mind if any annoyance crosses his path, or with whom to share some unusually sublime or illuminating inspiration. Woe to him that is alone, for when he falls, he has none to lift him up. He is entirely alone who is without a friend. But what happens, what security, what joy to have someone to whom you dare to speak on terms of equality as to another self, to one to whom you need to have no fear to confess your failings, one to whom you can unblushingly make known what progress you have made in the spiritual life, one to whom you can entrust all your secrets of your heart and before whom you can place all your plans. What, therefore, is more pleasant than to unite to yourself the spirit of another and two to form one, that no boasting is thereafter to be feared, no suspicion to be dreaded, and no correction by one of the other to cause pain, no praise on the part of one to bring a charge of adulation from the other. A friend, says the wise man, is the medicine of life. Excellent, indeed, is that saying. For medicine is not more powerful or more efficacious for our wounds in all our temporal needs than the possession of a friend who meets every misfortune joyfully, so that, as the Apostle says, shoulder to shoulder, they bear one another's burdens. Even more, each one carries his own injuries even more lightly than that of his friend. Friendship, therefore, heightens the joys of prosperity and mitigates the sorrows of adversity by dividing and sharing them. Hence, the best medicine in life is a friend. Even the philosophers took pleasure in the thought. Not even water, nor the sun, nor fire do we use in more instances than a friend. In every action, in every pursuit, in certainty, in doubt, in every event and fortune of whatever sort, in private and in public, in every deliberation at home and abroad, everywhere friendship is found to be appreciated, a friend a necessity, a friend's service a thing of utility. Wherefore friends, says Tullius, though absent are present, Though poor are rich, though weak are strong, and what seems stranger still, though dead are alive. And so it is that rich prize friendship as their glory, the exiles as their native land, the poor as their wealth, the sick as their medicine, as dead as their life, the healthy as their charm the weak as their strength and the strong as their prize, so great are the distinction, memory, praise, and affection that accompany friends that their lives are adjudged worthy of praise and their death rated as precious. And a thing even more excellent than all these considerations, friendship is a stage bordering upon that perfection which consists in the love and knowledge of God so that man from being a friend of his fellow men becomes a friend of God. According to the words of the Savior in the Gospel, I will not now call you servants, but my friends. Walter, I confess your words have so moved me and so enkindled my soul to a burning desire for friendship that I believe I am 
not even alive as long as I am deprived of the manifold benefits of this great good. But what you said last, the statement which aroused me so completely and almost carried me away from all earthly things, I desire to hear developed more fully, namely that among the stages leading to perfection, friendship is the highest. But see, here comes our friend Gratian, and quite opportunely. I might rightly call him friendship's child, for he spends all his energy in seeking to be loved and to love. It is opportune he came along, since he might be too eager for friendship and be deceived by its mere semblance, mistake the counterfeit for the true, the imaginary for the real, the carnal for the spiritual. Gratian, I thank you for your courtesy, brother. One not invited, but rather boldly imposing himself, you grant a place at this spiritual banquet. But if you thought that I should be called friendship's child in earnest, and not in jest, I should have been sent for at the beginning of this talk, and then I would not have had to lay aside due modesty and make a display of my eagerness. Nevertheless, father, continue where you began, and for my sake set something on the table, so that if I cannot be satiated as he is, for after consuming I know not how many courses, he summons me now to the remnants of the banquet of which he has grown disdainful, I may at least be able to be refreshed a little. All read. You need to have no fear, son, since matters of such importance still remain to be said on the good of friendship, that if some wise person were to carry them through to the end, you would think we had thus far said nothing. Nevertheless, turn your attention briefly to the matter in which friendship is, so to say, a stage toward the love and knowledge of God. Indeed, in friendship there is nothing dishonorable, nothing deceptive, nothing feigned. Whatever there is, is holy, voluntary, and true. This in itself is a characteristic of charity. In this, truly, friendship shines forth with a special right of its own, that among those who are bound by the tie of friendship, all joys, all security, all sweetness, all charms are experienced. Therefore, in the perfection of charity, we love very many who are a source of burden and grief to us, for those whose interest we concern ourselves honorably, not with hypocrisy or dissimulation, but sincerely and voluntarily. But yet we do not admit these to the intimacy of our friendship. And so, in friendship, are joined honor and charm, truth and joy, sweetness and goodwill, affection and action. And all these take their beginning from Christ, advance through Christ, and are perfected in Christ. Therefore, not too steep or natural does the ascent appear from Christ as the inspiration of the love by which we love our friend. To Christ giving himself to us as our friend for the for us to love, so that charm may follow upon charm, sweetness upon sweetness, and affection upon affection, and thus friend cleaving to friend in the spirit of Christ is made with Christ but one heart and one soul and so mounting aloft through the degrees of love to friendship with Christ, he is made one spirit with him in one kiss. Aspiring to this kiss, the saintly soul cries out, Let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. Let us consider the character of that carnal kiss, so that we may pass from the carnal to the spiritual, from the human to the divine. 
Man needs two elements to sustain life, food and air. Without food, he can subsist for some time, but without air, he cannot live even one hour. And so, in order to live, we inhale air with our mouths and exhale it. And that very thing which we exhale or inhale, we call breath. Therefore, in a kiss, two breaths meet and are mingled and are united. As a result, a certain sweetness of mind is born, which rouses and binds together the affection of those who embrace. There is, then, a corporal kiss, a spiritual kiss, and an intellectual kiss. The corporal kiss is made by the impression of the lips, the spiritual kiss by the union of spirits, the intellectual kiss through the Spirit of God, and by infusion of grace. Now the corporal kiss ought not to be offered or received except for definite and worthy reasons. For example, as a sign of reconciliation, when they become friends who were previously at enmity with one another, or as a mark of peace, those who are about to communicate in church manifest by an external kiss their interior peace, or as a symbol of love, such as is permitted between bride and bridegroom, or as is extended to and received from friends after a long absence, or as a sign of Catholic unity, as is done when a guest is received. But just as many people misuse water, fire, iron, food, and air, which are natural goods, by employing them in the instruments of their cruelty and lust, so, too, the perverse and lustful strive to give a relish to their shameful acts, even with this good which the natural law has instituted to signify the things we have indicated. Defiling this very kiss with such shame that to be kissed is nothing else than to be corrupted, how much such a kiss ought to be detested, abominated, shunned, resisted, every honorable person knows. In the next place, the spiritual kiss is characteristically the kiss of friends who are bound by one law of friendship, for it is not made by contact with the mouth, but with the affection of the heart, not by a meeting of lips, but by a mingling of spirits, by the purification of all things, and the Spirit of God, and, though his own part participation, it emits a celestial favor. I would call this the kiss of Christ, yet he himself does not offer it from his own mouth, but from the mouth of another breathing upon his lovers that most sacred affection, so that there seems to them to be, as it were, one spirit in many bodies. And they may say with the prophet, Behold how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. The soul, therefore, accustomed to this kiss and not doubting that all this sweetness comes from Christ, as if reflecting within itself and saying, Oh, if only he himself had come, sighs for the kiss of grace, and with the greatest desire exclaims, Let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. So that now, after all earthly affections have been tempered, and all thoughts and desires which savor the world have been quieted, the soul takes delight in the kiss of Christ alone and rests in this embrace, exulting and exclaiming, His left hand under my head and his right hand shall embrace me. Gratian, this type of friendship, as I see it, is not common, nor are we accustomed to dream of friendship as having such a character. I do not know what thought Walter has given it so far, but as for me, 
I believed friendship was nothing else than so complete an identity of wills between the two persons, that one would wish nothing which another did not wish, so that so great was the mutual harmony between both, in fortune, good, and evil, that neither life, nor wealth, nor honor, nothing whatsoever belonging to the one was denied to the other for his enjoyment and use according as he wished. Walter, I remember having learned something quite different in the first dialogue where the very definition of friendships set forth and explained, duly and ardently inspired me to have a more profound contemplation of its fruit. As we have been sufficiently informed on this point, we are trying to set up for ourselves a definite limit as to how far friendship would go, since in this matter there is a difference of opinion among various individuals. Now there are some who think they ought to love their friends, contrary to faith and honor, contrary to common or private good. Some judge that faith alone accepted, and the rest should not be held back. Others believe that on behalf of a friend, one ought to spurn money, reject honors, submit to enmities from those in high places, and not even shun exile. That one should even expose oneself to what is dishonorable and vile, provided only one's native land is not the sufferer nor one's neighborhood hurt. Again, there are those who set up this as the goal of friendship, that each one will so conduct himself towards his friend as he would towards himself. And some believe they satisfy the demands of friendship when they mutually repay their friend for every benefit of service. But from this discussion of ours, I am convinced that I ought to not have faith in any of these theorists, and that reason I should like you to set up a definite limit for friendship, particularly on the account of Gratian here, that he may not, in accordance with his name, be so eager to be gracious that he recklessly becomes vicious. Gratian I sincerely appreciate your thoughtful concern for me, and if I were not hampered by my ignorance to hear, I should, perhaps, take my revenge on you now. But let us hear together what response he plans to give to your questioning. Alred, Christ himself set up a definite goal for friendship when he said, Greater love than this, no man hath that a man lay down his life for his friends. See how far love between friends should extend, namely, that they be willing to die for one another? Does that seem adequate to you? Gratian, since no greater friendship is possible, why should it not be adequate? Walter, but if the wicked or pagans take such joy in the mutual harmony of evil and wickedness that they are willing to die for one another, shall we grant that they have reached the zenith of friendship? Allred, heaven forbid, since friendship cannot exist among the wicked. Gratian, tell me, pray, among who it can arise and be preserved. Allred, I shall tell you in a few words. It can begin among the good, progress among the better, and be consummated among the perfect. For as long as any one delights in a thing, an evil thing, from a desire of evil, as long as sensuality is more gratifying than purity, indiscretion than moderation, flattery than correction, how can it be right for such a one even to aspire to friendship when it springs from the esteem for virtue? It is difficult, therefore, nay, impossible, 
for you to taste its beginnings. If you do not know the fountain from which it came spring, for that love is shameful and unworthy of the name of friendship, wherein anything foul is demanded of a friend. And this is precisely what one is forced to do if, with vices in no wise dormant or subdued, he is either enticed or compelled to all sorts of illicit acts. Therefore, one ought to detest the opinion of those who think that one should act in behalf of a friend in a way detrimental to faith and uprightness. For it is not excuse for sin that you sin for the sake of a friend. The first of men, Adam, would have done better had he charged his wife with presumption instead of complying with her request by eating the forbidden fruit. And far better did the servants of King Saul preserve their loyalty to their master by withdrawing their hands from blood in violation of his command than Doeg the Edomite, who, as minister of the royal cruelty, killed with sacrilegious hands the priests of the Lord. Jonadab, too, the friend of Ammon, would have acted more laudably in preventing the incest of his friend than by offering advice to aid him in obtaining his object. Nor does the virtue of friendship excuse the friends of Absalom, who, consenting to treason, bore arms against their native country. But to come to these our own times, Otto, cardinal of the Roman Church, certainly was far more blessed in abandoning his close friend Guido than John was in clinging to his Octavian in so great a schism. You see, therefore, that friendship cannot exist except among the good. Gratian. What, then, has friendship to do with us, who are not good? I am not cutting good so finely, as do some who call no one good unless he is lacking with no wit in perfection. We call a man good, who, according to the limits of our morality, living soberly and justly and godly in this world, is resolved neither to ask others to do wrong, nor to do wrong himself at another's request. Gratian, what, then, has friendship to do with us who are not good? Allred, I am not cutting good so finely as do some who prefer to call one no one good unless he is lacking no wit in perfection. We call a man good according to the limits of our mortality, living soberly and justly and godly in this world, is resolved neither to ask others to do wrong nor to do wrong himself at another's request. Among such, indeed, we do not doubt that friendship can spring up and that by such it can be perfected. As for those who, apart from faith, danger of their fatherland, or unjust injury to another, put themselves at the disposal of the pleasure of their friends, I would say that they are not so foolish as they are insane. Sparing others, they do not see fit to spare themselves and safeguarding the honor of others they unhappily betray their own. Walter I almost agree with the opinion of those who say that friendship should be avoided, on the ground that it is a compact full of solicitude and care, not devoid of fear, and even subject to many griefs. For since it is enough, and more than enough, for anyone to bear his own burden, they say a man acts rashly, so, tying himself to others, that he must needs be involved in any cares and afflicted with many evils. Moreover, they think nothing is more difficult than friendship to abide even in the day of death, while on the other hand it would be quite shameful for a friendship 
to be formed and then turn it into the opposite. Therefore, they judge it is safer so to love others as to be able to hate them at will, and in so relaxed a manner to hold the reins of friendship that they may be tightened or loosened at will. Gratian, we have been laboring in vain, then, you in speaking, we in listening, if we can so easily withhold ourselves from the desire of friendship, the fruit of which is so holy, so useful, so acceptable to God, so near to perfection and recommendation to us in so many ways. Let us leave the opinion you have spoken of to the man who wishes today's love to be such that it may turn into hatred tomorrow. Who wishes to be the friend of all without trusting any? Who praises today and reviles tomorrow? Who flatters today and criticizes tomorrow? Who today is prepared for kisses and tomorrow is ready for reproaches? The love of such a man is acquired at a small price and at the slightest offense it disappears. Walter I used to think that doves lacked gall, but at any rate they tell us the opinion of those individuals who displease Gratian so much can be refuted. Elred, Tullia speaks beautifully on this point. They seem, he says, to take the sun out of the world, to take friendship out of life, for we have nothing better from God, nothing more pleasant. What wisdom is there in despising friendship so that you may avoid solicitude, be free from cares, or, or be devoid of fear? As if any virtue can be acquired or preserved without solicitude. Take your own life. Does prudence struggle against error, temperance against wantonness, justice against cunning, fortitude against cowardice, without any great anxiety on your part. Who, I ask, among men, especially among the young, is able to preserve his purity or strain, his sensual appetite, without a very great grief or fear? Paul must have been a fool, for he was unwilling to live without care and solicitude of, uh, for others. But for the sake of charity, when he believed to be of sovereign virtue, he was weak with the weak, on fire with the scandalized. And, too, great sorrow was his, and continued the grief of heart on behalf of his brethren in the flesh. Therefore he ought to have given up charity, assuredly, and under so many anxieties and griefs now being against labor for those who he had begotten, now cherishing as a nurse, now as a master admonishing, now fearing lest their minds be seduced from the faith, now with much grief and many tears exhorting to penance, now giving over to the impenitent. You see how these seek to take virtues out of the world, who fear not to take solicitude, their associate, from our midst. Was it no purpose that Chazuit, that Chuzai, the Arachite, preserved with such great fidelity his friendship with David, that he preferred anxiety and would rather share the griefs of his friend than relax amid the joys and honors of the patricide? I would say that those men are beasts rather than human beings who declare that a man ought to live in such a way as to be, to no one, a source of consolation, to no one a source even of grief or burden, to take no delight in the good fortune of another, or impart to others no bitterness because of their own misfortune. Caring to cherish no one and to be cherished by no one. Heaven forbid that I should grant that they truly love anyone who thinks of friendship as a trade. 
For such with their lips only declare themselves friends, when the hope of some temporal advantage favors them, or they try to make their friend an accomplice in some sort of base deed. Walter. Since, therefore, it is agreed that many are deceived by the mere semblance of friendship, tell us, pray, what sort of friendship we ought to avoid and that the sort we should ought to seek, cherish, and preserve. Allred. Since we have said that friendship cannot endure except among the good, it is easy for you to see that no friendship, which could be unbecoming to the good, is acceptable. Gratian. But perhaps we are not clear on the distinction between what is becoming and what is unbecoming. Allred, I shall comply with your wishes and state in a few words what friendships ought to be avoided should they present themselves to us. There is the puerile friendship begotten of an aimless and playful affection, directing its step after every passer-by without reason, without weight, without measure, without consideration of advantage or disadvantage. This type of friendship for a time affects one strongly. It draws one rather closely and entices one rather flatteringly. But affection without reason is an animal movement, inclined to everything illicit, nay, unable to distur discern licit from illicit. Moreover, though affection, for the most part, commonly precedes friendship, yet it ought never to be allowed, unless reason lead it, honor temper it, and justice rule it. Hence this friendship which we have styled puerile, because it is chiefly in children that feelings hold sway, ought as a thing unfaithful, unstable, and always mixed with impure loves, be guarded against every way by those who take delight in the sweetness of spiritual friendship. We call it not friendship, but friendship's poison, since the proper bounds of love, which extend from soul to soul, can never be observed in it. Rather rising like a mist from the concupiscence, of the flesh, it obscures and corrupts the true character of friendship, and through neglect of the spirit it draws one of the desires of the flesh. For that reason the beginnings of spiritual friendship ought to possess, first of all, purity of intention, the direction of reason, and the restraint of moderation. And thus, the very desire for such friendship, so sweet as it comes upon us, will presently make friendship itself a delight to experience, so that it will never cease to be properly ordered. Then there is the friendship which is based on a likeness in evil. Of this type I refrain from speaking since, as we have said before, it is not to be considered even worthy of the name of friendship. There is, besides, a friendship which the consideration of some advantage excites and which many think ought to be sought, encouraged and preserved for this reason. But if we admit this type, how many more, most worthy of all love shall we exclude? Those, namely, who, since they have nothing and possess nothing, offer, assuredly, no material game or hope, therefore, to anyone. But if you include among advantages, counsel in doubt, consolation in adversity, and other benefits of like nature, these in any case are to be expected from a friend. But they ought to follow friendship, not precede it. For he has not yet learned what friendship is, who wishes any reward other than itself. 
such a reward friendship will certainly be for those cultivating it. When wholly translated to God, it immerses in the divine contemplation of those whom it has united. For although friendship, sure of its blessing, brings many great advantages, nevertheless we are certain that friendship does not proceed from the advantage, but rather the advantages proceed from it. Indeed, we do not believe that a friendship arose between those great men because of the benefits of Barzillie, the Gilidite, bestowed on David when he was fleeing from his parasite son, receiving him, taking care of him, counting him among his friends. But rather we do not doubt that such a favor proceeded from friendship itself. There is no one who thinks that the king was in need of that man previous to his friendship with him. Indeed, that he himself, a man of great wealth, hoped for no compensance from the king for his deeds, one can clearly observe from the fact that when the king so generously offered him all the delights and riches of the state, he would not agree to take anything, preferring to be content with what he had. Similarly, we know that the sacred bond of friendship between David and Jonathan, which was consecrated through the hope of future advantage, but from the contemplation of virtue, was very profitable for both. The life of the one was preserved by the ingenuity of the other, but his own benefit in that his own posterity was thus preserved. Since, therefore, among the good, friendship always proceeds and advantages follow, surely it is not so much the benefit obtained through a friend that delights as the friend's love in itself. Now, then, whether we have said enough on the fruits of friendship or indicated clearly among these individuals, it can begin be observed and be perfected, whither, besides, have plainly disclosed the flattering subserviency which is clothed with the false name of friendship, and whether also we have set forth the definite limits upon which love among friends is to be extended. Of all the questions, you yourself be the judges. Gratian. I do not recall that this last point was sufficiently explained. Alred, but you remember, I think, that I refuted the opinion of those who established the limits of friendship at agreement on vices and evil deeds, but those also who think that one ought to go so far as to suffer exile or any form of dishonor, provided no harm is done to one's neighbor. but. I also refuted the opinion of those who measure out their friendship with the yardsticks of advantages anticipated. However, two of those forms of friendship which Walter proposed I did not consider even worthy of mention. For what can be more absurd than to extend friendship to the mere mutual repayment of one's friend through the services and compliments since all things ought to be in common among those who should indeed be of one mind and one soul. How base is this, too, would be for anyone to regard his friend only in the same way he regards himself, since each ought to have a low opinion of himself and a high opinion of his friend. Then, when we had completely disposed of these false ends of friendship, we thought that the true end ought to be set forth from the woods of the Lord who has taught that death itself in behalf of a friend should not be shunned. But in order that these base individuals thus disposed and willing to die for one another might not be regarded as having reached the zenith of friendship, we further indicated among which 
persons, friendship can arise and be perfected. Then we express the belief that those who, on account of their many anxieties and cares which friendship entails, thinks it should be for that reason be voided, ought to be charged with absurdity. Finally, we explained as briefly as possible which friendships ought to be avoided by all good people. It is clear, then, from this whole discussion, namely that nothing ought to be denied to a friend, nothing ought to be refused for a friend, which is less than the very precious life of the body, which divine authority has taught would be laid down for a friend. Hence, since the life of the soul is of far greater excellence than that of the body, any action, we believe, should be altogether denied a friend which brings about the death of the soul, that is, sin, which separated God from soul and from soul from life. But what limit ought to be preserved and what caution be maintained in those actions which one should perform for a friend or tolerate in his behalf, this is not the time to decide. Gratian, I admit that our friend Walter has benefited me not a little. In response to his questioning, you have summoned up a brief epilogue, the principal points of the discussion, and have, so to speak, fixed them in the memory. And now, please tell us what limit should be preserved in, in serving one's friends, and what caution should be kept in mind. Alred both these and other matters pertaining to friendship remain to be discussed, but an hour has already passed, and these others who have just arrived are by their patience, as you see, hustling me off to other business. Walter, you may be sure I leave unwillingly. Tomorrow, indeed, when occasion presents itself, I intend to return and let our friend Gratian see to it that he is on time tomorrow morning, that he may not accuse us of neglect, or we accuse him of tardiness.